Here's how to code every single post-processing effect in Unity by alphabetical order. So we're of course going to start off with Bloom, but before we begin we're going to have to be using UnityEngine.Rendering and UnityEngine.Rendering.Universal. So we of course have to create a reference to Bloom, but we can't directly access this in the scene, so we're going to have to kind of grab it through the volume. Uh, and you can call that in the start function, and that's volume.profile.tryGetOutBloom. So it's kind of just the volume that you need. You could set Bloom to be a private variable, but I'll keep it public here. And now when we try to change our Bloom's intensity, for instance, we run into another problem that has to do with value types, but it's easily solved by writing dot value after intensity in this case. But this might be a bit too bright, so uh, let's change the threshold to something like one to make it a bit easier on the eye. This, of course, follows the same structure as does color for the tint or texture for the dirt texture. You just have to write dot value after. Channel mixers might look a bit confusing at first, but they simply have an output and input channel. And if you would want to change the blue input of the green output, for instance, you just have to write green out and blue in. This of course follows the same structure no matter which colors you're using for inputs or outputs, but I'll use red out, red in for now. So changing the red out, red in value is of course just as simple as the bloom, uh, but I'll just max this one out to 200. So at this point, changing the chromatic aberration should be super easy, but if you still want to know, here's how to do it. Moving on, we have another effect that can be short down to CA, which of course is color adjustments. And color adjustments has post exposure, contrast, hue shift, and saturation, which are all floats. But when it comes to color filter, uh, which is a color, you can of course create a new color. I'll set the color filter value to be equal to this color, of course. And if we change this, everything is going to work normally. Uh, I'll change that halfway to red. But in fact, this is an HDR color, so we're gonna, of course, want to change the intensity. And to do that, we simply multiply the color by two to the power of intensity. And that's exactly how Unity does it, so we're gonna get this nice glowing effect, which is a bit too bright, so I'll just revert that. So now we're getting to possibly the most confusing effect of them all, which is color curves. And to make this somewhat possible to understand, we're going to have to break it down into two steps. The first one being keyframes. And a keyframe, of course, has an X position, which goes into the first parameter, and a Y position. And then it also has a direction. So imagine that you're sitting at 0, 0, and you're pointing towards that coordinate. And then we also actually have an output direction, which you can't really access without code. So if we add some more keyframes, we can put those in an array. I'll call this keyframes. And now we're done with the first step that I mentioned. So uh, we can now put these keyframes into a texture curve. So that's going to be the first parameter. And then the second parameter is going to be the default value for when the uh, texture curve doesn't have a keyframe, and then a boolean for whether or not it should be a loop, and then a vector2 for the bounds, so uh, this is always going to be between 0 and 1. I'll now call this texture curve tc and set the color curves.master.value to be equal to tc. Then we also have red, green, and blue, of course. We also have hue versus hue, hue versus saturation, saturation versus saturation, and luminosity versus saturation. So let's now add some blur into the scene. And we of course do this with depth of field. And as you probably already know, we have an option for Gaussian and for Bokeh. And this is how you would change the depth of field mode. This is a bit different from what we're used to. And I'm not going to change all the values here, that'll take too long, but 
Um, what's fun about this is that you can change the, for instance, the bokeh values if you have depth of field mode to be set to Gaussian. It's not like you're ever going to need to switch between them, probably, but it's just fun to know. And for film grain, it's basically the same approach. It's a film grain lookup this time. And we, of course, have thin one and thin two, as well as medium one through six. And then we have large O1 and large O2, which can be kind of confusing. I don't know why they did that, but that's how it is. So we, of course, also have uh, intensity and all those, but you know how to do this. And now we have an option for custom, which requires a texture 2D. And now we're at lens distortion, so I'm going to make the uh, intro in reverse now. Uh, I just ran randomly stumbled across this. I don't know how I did that because it's kind of easy to miss. And it might look cool at first, but it's you can't really do much with it. It's just one simple effect and that's all. Moving on to lift gamma gain, we have another color with an intensity, but this is not an HDR color this time. So we're simply going to plug this into the alpha of the color, which is like a W for a vector 4. Now we're at motion blur, uh, which uses motion blur quality for low, medium and high, and some floats, which you already know how to use, most likely. Panini projection is nothing new, we just have to change some uh, float values. So it's distance and crop to fit, nothing new here. And then we got shadows, midtones, highlights, which is the same approach as with uh, lift gamma gain. It's just a, an, a kind of intensity that you put into the alpha of the color. For split toning, we have uh, a balance to balance the shadows and highlights. And those, of course, are colors. And for tone mapping, we have another enumerator. It's tone mapping mode, which has an option for none, neutral, and ACES. Also, notice how tone mapping is written with a lowercase m. And second to last, we, of course, have vignette. It has a color color and a center vector 2, an intensity and smoothness float, as well as a rounded volume. And this, of course, just a repetition at this point, um, might be useful to know that the center is just a fraction of the width and height of the screen. And that's basically all with vignette. And now lastly, we have white balance, which has two different floats for temperature and tint. I'll just go through these, which this the scene gets a little bit too red, I think, so I'll just revert those to zero. So I hope this video helped you. Uh, here's the full look at the entire script again, if uh, you've forgotten. Um, so yeah, I'll see you.